Uh, okay, guys, I've made this video to help you in preparation for your data test. This, in fact, was the data test we gave you at 12s last year. You will recognize a lot of it because we've been doing it as the worksheets in class. Uh, this is the one we did most recently. This was worksheet four. The vinegar sample being diluted and then titrated against NaOH and the titration curve obtained. Okay. Now, this will be provided for you in a separate data book uh, or data sort of um, booklet that will go with the test, which will look like this. You will get, by the way, 60 minutes and 10 minutes perusal. That should be more than enough time. And the first question is to determine the pH of the equivalence point. Now, we've done this in class. If you want to get the pH of the equivalence point, this is the volume at the equivalence point, and the pH at the equivalence point is the midsection of this vertical bit. So very, very carefully, please, see where it starts, see where it finishes, find the midpoint, use a ruler to draw a line across, and where it meets the axis, record the pH. In the mark scheme, The value would be 8.6, and you were okay as long as you were within 0.2 either side of that. The second question, distinguish the half equivalence point from the equivalence point in terms of pH and volume of NaOH. Okay, now then. The equivalence point was there. The equivalence point's volume is 20. So therefore, the volume at the half equivalence point would be 10. If you want the pH at that point, then you would draw a vertical line. Use a ruler, please. Do not do it by hand. Draw a vertical line up from 10 to where it meets the curve. Then draw a horizontal line across using the ruler. And where it meets the pH axis, read that pH. Let's look at the mark scheme. Now then, first of all, you will get one mark for the volume of 10. You will get one mark for showing how you work that out. I know it's obvious, but you must say volume at equivalence point is 20. Therefore, the volume at the half equivalence point is half of that, which is 10. Okay. Then you get another mark for reading off the pH at the half equivalence point, which is 4.7. And again, they will allow you 0.2 either side. Question three, determine the pKa for the ethanoic acid. I've shown you how to do this in class. The pKa for the ethanoic acid, let me recall and remember, is the pH at the half equivalence point. Now, if you've forgotten how this worked, the Ka for the, for the weak acid will be the H plus concentration times the A minus over the HA. At the start of this titration, only HA was present. At the end of the titration, only A minus is present. So at the halfway point, half of the HA has become A minus and half is still HA. So in the Ka expression, a minus and HA will cancel. That will leave Ka equal to H plus concentration. And negative logs of both sides, pKa will equal pH. So effectively, the answer here is exactly the same as the answer there. Again, if you were, say, 4.8 or 4.9 or some other value either side, then they will, you would obviously be putting that same value there. Um, can I just make it clear to you guys, when it says FT, allow for follow-through error. So let's say you got that completely wrong and put a value there which was outside of that range. As long as you put that same value there, we would follow through that error. Uh, next question is, which indicator would be the suitable one and give a reason? Now, if you look at the titration curve, this is the pH change at the equivalence point. The indicator will indicate that change. 
if its range is somewhere on that vertical section. It must be completely within there. If it's a bit in there and a bit outside there, that won't work. So the best indicator would be one that changes somewhere between, say, about, well, say we're on about seven point something and maybe 10 point something. If you look at the table of indicators in the data book, probably phenolphthalein is your best bet. And you will get one mark for saying phenolphthalein and you'll get one mark for saying its range is within that pH range at the end point. Okay. O-W-T-T-E means all words to that effect. Okay. So just make sure you explain clearly, concisely, thoroughly what you're trying to say. Uh, question five, calculate the concentration of the ethanoic acid in the vinegar and show your working. Now, again, we did this in class. Let me remind you, we started with 25 mil of the diluted vinegar. It was diluted 1 to 50. It was titrated with 0.1 NaOH, and 20 of that was required. Now, the acid is clearly monoprotic. So therefore, the ratio when it reacts with NaOH will be one to one. And with that said, let's look at the mark scheme and see how it's done. So it's saying moles of ethanoic acid would be the same as the moles of NaOH. That's your one to one ratio. Concentration of NaOH is 0 0.1. Volume is 20 divided by 1,000 because this must be in liters. That will give you 0 0.002 moles of ethanoic acid. Now that's in 25 mils. So the, therefore the concentration would be 0 0.002 divided by 25 times 1,000, which is 0 0.08 moles per liter. You will get one mark for each of those two stages. And the final mark, basically, if you remember, it was diluted 1 to 50. So the final mark is for multiplying that by 50 to give you an answer of 4 moles per liter. Question two requires this data here. Again, it's exactly the same. I've told you this, we did these questions in class. All I'm doing now is going through it again in case you forget what I said in class. So you've got the harbor process for making ammonia, gaseous nitrogen and hydrogen are reacted together to make the ammonia. We are plotting the percentage yield of ammonia against pressure at five different temperatures. These are questions we've already answered. Question one, identify the relationship between pressure and percentage of ammonia. So you can see very clearly as pressure goes up, percentage yield of ammonia goes up. And you'll get one mark for saying that. As the pressure increases, the percentage of ammonia also increases. Second question, why does that relationship exist? Now, again, remember, we are using Le Chatelier. There are four moles of gas on the left and two on the right. So when you increase pressure, the system will shift to the side of less gas to oppose that change, to lower the pressure. If you look at the mark scheme, it'll say it identifies the number of moles of gas on the left and the number of moles on the right. And an increase in pressure then is opposed by a shift towards the side that exerts less pressure, less gas, okay? Um, I don't think you need to quote Le Chatelier's principle, but the word opposed pretty much is covering that, okay? If you, if you remember Le Chatelier's principle, put it in. It's not going to hurt. It'll take you seconds to write that in, and then you're playing very, very safe. Question eight temperature and percentage relationship. If you look at the graphs again, you will see as the temperature increases, the percentage yield decreases. Okay, there's your best yield. Uh, Kelvin, of course, is a 273, so that would be done at 100 degrees centigrade. And this one is done at 500 degrees centigrade. Okay, Kelvin temperatures are given. So clearly, as the temperature increases, the percentage yield decreases. Now, again, you're going to be asked to justify that. Okay, so there's your first mark. As the temperature increases, 
percentage D of ammonia decreases. Now then, uh, regarding this, so what are you going to say? Basically, you have to obviously state that again, the reaction is moving to oppose the change. So if you increase the temperature, the system is clearly shifting to the left, decreasing the amount of ammonia. It's shifting to the left to oppose the change, Le Chatelier, which means going from ammonia to the reacting gases must be absorbing heat. So that is an endothermic reaction. And if that's the case, of course, then the forward reaction would be exothermic, which you're going to get a mark for in part five. Exactly the same as the one we did in class. Okay, Justify why it exists and then deduce whether it's exothermic or endothermic. Okay, so there is the mark scheme answer. Make sure you do not leave anything out. The final question involves a third data set. And the third data set is basically, we haven't done this one in class. Um, you're given four acids and four Ka values. Now the formulas are given. You will notice that the first, third and last are all monoprotic, one hydrogen, whereas the second one, H2S, is diprotic. Three of them will have just one K value because they've only got one hydrogen to lose, but hydrosulfuric acid has two K values, corresponding to the loss of the first H plus and the second H plus. It's always more difficult to lose the second one. This is why this one is much, much lower. Okay, the question says, which of the acids is the stronger one or to distinguish it? Stronger should be strongest, I think, because there are four of them, but the Ka value, remember, the bigger the Ka value, the stronger the acid. So look at these values here. Hydrofluoric acid has the biggest value. Hydrofluoric acid would be the strongest acid there. Okay. So HF has the highest Ka, therefore the strongest acid. That was only worth one mark. The second question says, and this might be the last question. It is. Yeah, the last question. If 20 ml of hydrofluoric and hydrosulfuric acid were each titrated against one molar solution of NaOH, deduce which acid would require more NaOH. Now, please realize a titration will be based on the number of... Sorry, guys, I thought that was the end of the recording. Uh, it was actually an email arriving uh, that made the noise. I still have enough time to explain this before the video finishes. Okay, if you are titrating 20 of an acid, regardless of the, the strength of the acid, so let's have a look at the two acids. You have HF, you have H2S. Now, as long as they have the same concentration, H2S will require twice as many moles of NaOH because there are two H pluses which have to react. Remember, doing equations involved in, say, sulfuric acid, H2S of 4 plus 2 NaOH, as opposed to HCl, which is just 1 NaOH. What effectively that means is that because H2S is diprotic, H2S will require twice the volume to neutralize. Okay? Now, if that's not clear, guys, talk to me in class, please. Um, I think that's pretty much all. Hopefully, that'll help you in preparation for the data test. And again, we will be doing lots more questions in class before that happens.